on today's podcast. Um, but those postbiotics, the one of the most important ones is butyrate. And so that's supposed to keep our cells um, healthy, but also plays a role in the metabolic process. So butyrate actually, um, the short chain fatty acids actually can help stimulate things like GLP-1, which is the hormone that tells your body to make insulin, tells your brain you're full. It's the hormone that, you know, our big drugs that um, are out on the market for weight loss and diabetes right now are actually mimicking because the hormone has such an important um, role. And so all of that really starts in our microbiome. If you're a healthcare provider tired of just treating symptoms and ready to dig deeper into the root causes of health issues, the Vibrant Wellness Podcast is for you. With insider tips, expert interviews, and the latest in biotech research, this podcast will take your patient care to the next level. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jen Rivas here with the none other Dr. Emmy Brown. Dr. Emmy, how are you doing today? I'm feeling great, Jen. What about yourself? I am so excited because we're going to talk about something we've never really talked about before. Uh, today, we're privileged to speak with Dr. Melody Hartzler with a laser-like focus on functional gastrointestinal disorders, nutritional defi deficiencies, metabolic marvels, and autoimmune anomalies. Dr. Hartzler is not your run-of-the-mill healthcare professional. Her passion for the intricacies of functional medicine wasn't merely sparked by textbooks and lectures. It was ignited by her, her own journey to wellness and gut rejuvenation. A nationally recognized speaker on diabetes and functional medicine, Dr. Hartzler's quest to untangle the web of healthcare led her to become a board-certified ambulatory care pharmacy specialist, say that five times fast, <laughs> and a holder of the esteemed board certified in advanced diabetes management. Super exciting. So as the mastermind behind Farm to Table and Farm is spelled P-H-A-R-M, she's on a mission to revolutionize healthcare through the lens of functional medicine, and we cannot wait to dive in. So let's welcome doc Dr. Hartzler to the podcast. I can't get your name out. It's just not rolling <laughs> on my tongue. Sorry, sorry. We'll blame those like Switzerland <laughs> background and my husband's family. But yeah. if you're from Northeast Ohio, you would know that name and be able to roll it right off your tongue. Well, <laughs> it's like Smith up it. there. <laughs> and we'll work on it. But welcome. Yeah, so good to thank you. you. Thank you. So good, to so good to be here. So I'm excited. Yeah, we're excited. To chat with you guys today. And before we get into functional medicine, Dr. Hartzler, I'd love to know, let's go way back. Why pharmacology? Why did you go to pharmacy school? Yeah. So my mom was a nurse. And so I saw her really taking care of people and serving people. And I think when you're like a high school student and you're like, what am I going to do with my life? You're seeing like the people in your life and what they're doing. And so part of it was from that. And I also saw her do some really hard things as a nurse. So I saw her, you know, lit heavy lifting, heavy people like doing all of the cleanup and all of the like stuff that the gross stuff from a nursing side of things, too. Like she would tell us all these crazy stories like. And so I think I just knew that I wanted to be in healthcare, but I didn't want to do that. Right. Because saw mom like, you know, doing an amazing job at what she was doing, but it wasn't necessarily something I wanted to do with all the blood and guts and all of that stuff. And, um, you know, I, you know, between pharmacy school and med school, I just knew also that I wanted to be a mom and have a family. And um, while I think there are a lot of amazing women rocking it in physician roles and um, being moms, I just felt like that like eight year journey plus residency was going to be a lot. And um, so I decided there's a couple of schools, actually, there's several schools that have pharmacy programs that you can actually enter into after high school. So you're a senior and then you go straight into a program that's either like a zero six or a zero seven. So it's like a direct entry pharmacy program. So that's what I did at Ohio Northern. I um, have really enjoyed this um, career and just there's so many different avenues that you can take in pharmacy as well. Um, but my career has mostly been spent in ambulatory care pharmacy. So what that means is the person is is up and walking, right? And I always say that's like stupid that we call it that in pharmacy because we really should call it like primary care, like our colleagues call it as far as other um, medical professionals. But we, we do have pharmacists that are in specialty clinics sometimes that are ambulatory clinics, like even in oncology or cardiology. But majority of pharmacists that are ambulatory care pharmacists are working in some kind of primary care space. Yes. But along that journey, I found functional medicine through my own health journey. So I guess we could talk about that if that's yes, where you want to go or did you want to <laughs> go somewhere else? Yeah. 
you, so, you have to see uh, our questions. You're already leaving yes, the next one. Yes, one. So yes. I also away. host a podcast, so I got the, I got the <laughs> flow. Progression. Um, <laughs> yes. So basically, when I had my first child, I personally had issues with probably had issues prior to having her that I didn't really even realize. But I think my birth experience with her was sort of like and I, I, I use the word trauma lightly because I know there are people that have been through like way more traumatic experiences. But I felt like that was my sort of like nail in the coffin sort of like over, you know, thing that sort of set me over the edge. So I had a rough uh, labor and delivery and then also a a rough recovery. And then my daughter had tongue tie. And then so like, I didn't really know what that was, nor did anyone else on the care team ever point that out. And not that it was like severe enough that most people would have seen it, but it did affect like our nursing relationship. And then so it took me like three weeks to figure out why my child was not eating properly and why you know, we're up in the middle of the night and she's got crazy tummy pain and like all of this kind of stuff. So, so we did thankfully have a chiropractor on our care team at that point that I started learning more about food sensitivities and started pulling things out of my diet and started recognizing the connection between some of the symptoms she was having and some of the symptoms um, and things going on. But ultimately, I think I had somewhat of a leaky gut that contributed to some of her symptoms. Um, and larger proteins probably being my breast milk than they should have been. And then ultimately developed dysbiosis, SIBO, had, you know, more hormone imbalance type things. After I stopped nursing her, I didn't have a cycle for like six months. And I was like, okay, this is not normal, you know. Um, so I went to one another provider. And I think like the important piece of like my story too is that it wasn't one person that I met that was like, here's your solution, right? So there was like one doctor that I went to that did do a a little bit of a gut workup, didn't super, not a super deep dive, but did some acupuncture. Um, But then this other doctor I met, she was like, oh, you're, you're not going to get better without, um, you're not going to get your cycle back without acupuncture. And I had done a tiny bit of acupuncture, but not like with a real acupuncturist. So I was like, okay, well, I have postmenopausal hormones. I'm here at like, what was I, 32 at the time or something. And so I was like, sure, I'll go to acupuncture. So I did. You know, and I had learned a little bit about chase tree and some of these other like herbs that help support your cycle. And so I had started to incorporate those. But long story short, I got my cycle back within like a month and a half and um, also had gone through during that time like SIBO treatment. And, you know, at one point I called the Cleveland Clinic to be, you know, like go to their functional medicine clinic because they're in Ohio here, but they had like a crazy long wait list. And by the time I was even like called to like have an appointment, they're like, okay, well, I was feeling better. And I was like, well, I don't know if I need to go or not. But again, I was like, well, I want to learn from them. So I'm going to go as a patient, see how it works in their facility. Um, So it was probably a two or three year journey back to like getting hormones balanced to the point where I could conceive another child. And, And so as I started to learn all this stuff about myself and how the gut, you know, impacts, my daughter also had food allergies. So she started reacting to, at the beginning, it was like almonds and eggs and even peas, um, but like starting to put the connections there with like the hyperpermeability and the gut and the and the food intolerances. And did the pea allergy come from the fact that I drank pea protein strikes during pregnancy when I had intestinal permeability? Maybe, I don't know, like there's no really way. I mean, there's some conversations about some of those things. And so with my second pregnancy, I tried to make sure I was rotating proteins a lot more um, instead of like honing in on like one or two things. And thankfully my son and I introduced, like, whenever I'd introduce a new food with him, I and I don't know, again, if this did anything, it's an end of one situation. But I <laughs> would give him, like, probiotics at the same time, similar to, like, how they do oral um, oral immune therapy, where they do, like, probiotic capsules with proteins to help people tolerate it better. But I would, anytime we give a new food, we get, like, Flair Labs infant uh, probiotics with it at the same time or the metagenics drops. Um, but anyway, so I think that the gut connection, and then, like, over time, I started to... Um, realize the connection between gut health and metabolism and diabetes and started to really incorporate this. And also, like, as I'm talking, I take care of a lot of women um, that have diabetes and they're all postmenopausal, um, not all of them, but a lot of times that's the time where, like, as the hormones decrease, blood sugars start to rise. And but I started to, you know, see those connections. I suck talking to these women having these gallbladder issues um, and having IBS symptoms 
or even they had their gallbladder removed years ago and now they've got diabetes and more IBS symptoms and bloating. And so I started to sort of put all the pieces together of that. And in my practice, my next practice that I was at was a more um, Medicare slash um, commercial insured population instead of the federally qualified healthcare center. So I was able to do a little bit more with the physicians and other um, providers there about, you know, addressing some of those issues um, to the point where like my collaborative practice agreement now includes um, IBS and some of these other conditions because we're looking at that from a functional medicine approach. So, so yeah, so over time, I started taking care of patients. And, you know, when I was able to offer patients day one of starting to introduce some of these testing was obviously drastically different than what we do now. And um, I'm almost finished with a 4 m fellowship. Um, actually, why we're talking here and they're texting me asking me if I'm going to take my exam <laughs> this <laughs> month. Um, but um, so I, you know, it's really, I like the integrative component. I mean, certainly there's the functional versus integrative crowds. And I, you know, I think all of it has its place because there are some people, you know, especially with diabetes, that if you have metabolic memory and if we've had our blood sugars uncontrolled for 10 years or even five years, there's a lot of times that we can't completely reverse it with those diet and lifestyle changes and we may need to use medications. And But if we are using those medications, you know, which ones are we using? Let's use the ones, you know, that are most appropriate and the ones that, you know, decrease risk for other things or maybe have less hypoglycemia or they um, maybe don't cause drugs that, you know, have the reason to be on, but might have nutrient depletions addressing those. So making sure we're sort of pulling it, pulling all the data together. Um, so I think that's the hard, I think that's the thing I like about that space because there's, I mean, if you just think about the world and like people on Facebook or wherever you're reading articles about, there's just such this like drastic divide between like, I'm like, I mean, I mean, if you think about vaccines, for example, I mean, you're either in this camp or this camp. If you start talking about a delayed schedule and like how we could study things to see if this actually um, does increase risk of something, it's like, no, like they're, it's just like totally different. So I feel like sometimes even in this integrative holistic space, there is that like, you know, oh, we're completely like not doing medication or we're, you know, on the other on the other side where we're not even thinking about holistic intervention. But they're probably like, you know, the alt middle is, you know, somewhere in between that we have to sometimes take care of people. Um, and sometimes those well-studied interventions that are maybe pharmaceuticals might be, might be appropriate. So, um, I think the other thing that pharmacists sometimes bring to this, this space too, is that like a lot of providers that are getting into the functional integrative medicine may not have a lot of experience, um, managing patients with chronic healthcare conditions. So maybe they were a PA or a nurse practitioner in like a more acute care setting. And then they start getting these patients that have all kinds of like psychiatric medications or, um, need to titrate off things. And so really that's not something that they have necessarily like experienced before since sometimes it depends on their practice setting of where they, you know, had a job, um, prior. So, um, so our team definitely um, has has been supportive in helping people with that um, over the years, too. Mm, thank you for sharing. I love always yeah. love to hear the backstory. You know, it's, yeah. it's the paths that we take to get to where we are. And and hopefully, if and when your daughter listens to this 10 years from now, she's going to know what uh -huh. an advocate she has in her mother. Yes. So, so lucky. Yes. What, a, what a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, Dr. Hartzler, I want to dive a little bit deeper yeah. in your specific focus areas. So yeah. gastrointestinal disorders, nutritional deficiencies, metabolic conditions, autoimmune conditions. Mm -hmm. These areas often come with a lot of misconceptions, right? So if you could shed a little light on your unique approach um, and challenges to these misconceptions and, and how, you know, your approach can certainly help to lead to better outcomes. Yeah. So I think like the most challenging thing um, is that in a lot of conventional practices or mainstream practices, you know, patients are still not feeling well, right? They go to their doctor or, you know, other provider and they explain their symptoms and they're just like, well, your labs look good. I mean, we've all heard that before. A patient says your labs look good. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. Maybe even patients are told it's all in their head. Um, and so that certainly is frustrating. And when it comes to things like IBS, um, sometimes it surprises me how mainstream gastroenterology, how, how traditional and it is, um, because there is like, you know, major places like Cedar sinai like studying all about SIBO and all of the things. 
But it's taking a long time for that information to really circle back to um, like Pimitol's work and Allison Seabarker's work. Like they're doing, they have lots of data. And for some reason, you know, getting it in the mind of, you know, your traditional gastroenterology team um, to really address those with patients has been challenging. So patients will go there. And sometimes there are people out there like prescribing, you know, um, prescription antibiotic um, called Zyfaxin to address that. But sometimes it's just not enough because certain strains of bacteria might not be covered very well by it, or there's other things going on in the gut, like yeast or um, even like other organisms that aren't yeast or bacteria contributing to the problem. So people are still having symptoms and um, and and that piece. And the other thing is like proton pump inhibitor use is like way over wow. the top in our country. Yes, it's insane. It's like the top, you know, 10 medications, one of the top 10 medications. And so what I'm seeing now, I'm in a new, I'm went uh, self, I'm started being self-employed about a year ago. And so I contract to a, a physician that I worked with in the past um, in her new practice. And there's a lot of patients um, that are older and they are, have been on PPIs for years and they say, well, I can't get off of them. Or I've been told I need to take this the rest of my life. Um, and, you know, unless someone has like Barrett's esophagus where they have like significant damage that is precancerous, like there's really not a lot of conditions that we have to be on this for the rest of our life. Um, and so really helping and people like it's hard because you're going up against like their GI doc that's like doing all their screenings and making sure they're, you know, safe. And so, you know, having conversations with people about some of those things is challenging and so especially and coming in, it is hard if they have like physical reasons that they also can't come off. So maybe like a hiatal hernia is contributing to why they're having um, GERD symptoms or heartburn symptoms. So so we try, you know, to work the best we can. But a lot of people that have those PPRs on board have SIBO. So they have that small intestinal um, bacterial overgrowth because of the PPI causing the change in the acid base balance. And they don't have that acid to suppress the excess bacterial growth and um, so, you know, so I'm seeing a lot of patients like that and a lot of people that have the combination of that. And then they've got intestinal permeability that's contributing to autoimmune conditions. And so it's just sort of a vicious cycle. And then they're so tired because they don't have a good iron absorption. So their ferritin, they're like 20 or 16. And you're like, well, no wonder you're exhausted. <laughs> your blood cells, your, all your cells in your body need iron in the Krebs cycle. And so, um, so I think that's the frustrating part about, you know, some of being a provider in this, you know, healthcare system is that so many times people are told they're fine and we're not actually looking at do they have the nutrients in their body to optimize their energy and to really um, help people thrive. So um, that's why I, I always am like, OK, we don't like that. People will say, oh, I'm surviving or I'm here. But like, <laughs> that's not what we're here for. We're here that's to thrive. Right. We're here to be in community with people. We're here to serve other people. And, um, you know, we want to get people back to a place where they are thriving. So we um, actually one of our new programs is called Thrive. Um, I put it on my license plate. I've got like a license plate <laughs> rack around it. It says like, are you ready to thrive? You know, so that they see that. But um, but yeah, so I'm all about like, let's get you to the point where you're thriving. And yes, we're going to have hard days, but um, it's going to be we need to be optimizing like our physiology. So that's my frustration from the GI standpoint. Um, and then also there's, you know, from the diabetes standpoint, or even just like I see a lot of like patients with anxiety and um, our healthcare system doesn't have very good mental health support. I mean, we have great um, psychiatrists for the people that really need them, but they're really hard to get into. And normally their interventions are very medication heavy. And certainly if someone is in crisis, we absolutely want them to get that kind of care. But for people that are not in severe crisis, but are just like trying to like get to the point of thriving because they're just feeling like they, they're in this place where they are so anxious, um, really like they go to the doctor and all they're offered is a medication. They're not offered even sometimes not even offered counseling. And so and I realize there's probably like a low like we need more people out there providing counseling because some of those services list wait lists are backed up months. Um, but even things like um, EMDR for people that have trauma, I mean, I think our generally our healthcare system doesn't really um, recognize the significance of trauma in chronic disease. And certainly we could go through all kinds of statistics of how trauma, you know, it, it has le led to chronic conditions. Um, 
And so whether it's like, you know, I've heard stories about patients that were, you know, obese and, you know, the reason why they're eating and this compulsive eating behavior is because they were abused when they were a child. And so they felt like when they would eat and if they would be larger and undesirable, someone would leave them alone. And so you think about like what that happened to someone as like a a young child and then that's like all the rest of their life. And and not until they were, you know, an adult is someone really trying to, you know, um, go back to that traumatic experience and help them work through those those thoughts. Um, so there's lots of, you know, interconnections of traumatic experiences, whether they're, you know, and again, I even had some patients that maybe their traumatic experience was related to COVID and just like the absolute shift of everything in their life. Um during that time and why that's not the same as the first story that I share, there is some element of, you know, your brain sort of, you know, functioning differently because of that. So really that's a big thing because we have to like help people be able to function before they can get well. And unfortunately, um, like I said, there's just not a lot of resources and the standard medical community. And I'm not the person like providing the counseling either, but just, you know, making sure we identify that that's a need for the patient referring them to the appropriate person. There's even programs like retrainingthebrain.com has a great program to help people work through that kind of stuff as well. Um, So yeah, so that would be another thing that I feel like is just sort of missing from, from, you know, as far as a frustration with the healthcare system and um, some of those patients experiencing this condition. But as far as like metabolic things, like blood sugar management too. I mean, sort of alongside the anxiety thing, like I've had patients that they come in and they're like, I'm so anxious. I'm waking up sweating in the middle of the night. Their doctors are checking hormone levels and all of these things. We put a CGM on them. They're waking up in the middle of the night because their blood sugar is dropping to 55, not because their estrogen's low or their progesterone. And so um, there's so much blood sugar, you know, roller coasters going on in a lot of these people, partially because of the nutrition available to them in our societies, quick, you know, carb foods and fast foods. And, um, you know, they're not getting that steady protein um, to help balance the carbs. They're not saying carbs, not saying carbs are bad, necessarily bad. Although there's lots of different opinions out there about yeah. that. Um, but we definitely needed to be sustained and we don't want people dropping, you know, overnight or even during the day because um, that can definitely make you feel anxious. And so if you're sort of having these bouts of anxiety, like sometimes that can be a contributing factor. But I had this one patient recently that told me she was like she was so upset that like her previous provider who was an endocrinologist didn't recognize that. And she was having even trouble getting past that, like the fact that just the system like sort of failed her in a way like that she went to a provider who should you know be evaluating her hormones and her glucose and because she didn't have diabetes that's not what they were they were looking at so um so I think they just like in all of this like all the connections and everything we just have to sort of like step back and we always say like we have to listen to the patient's story um because if she hadn't described to me her whole day and I hadn't sat there for 20 minutes listening to all of this like I wouldn't have heard her you know, say, well, I'm having these like night sweats at night and I'm having, you know, waking up like this. And she told me like every time she wakes up, she eats crackers and she feels better. And then I was like, (laughs) okay, well, that's, you know, not hormones. You're not getting like more estrogen because of your crackers, right? This is something else going on here. So, um, so I think the biggest issue with our healthcare system is that our providers don't have time to hear their patient's story. Um, and you know, we could, there's a lot of reasons for that. But um, but yeah, so I think that's why so many functional medicine providers are are not taking insurance and only operating on membership models or cash-based models. And it is unfortunate to some degrees because we have, you know, patients that can't afford that type of care. And so I'm trying to work through models um with some of our businesses about how how we can provide this kind of support as a supplement to a practice that might be an insurance practice using like chronic care management type codes and things like that. But um, so hopefully there's, you know, going to be pilots out there doing some of this. And I know you guys guys are probably familiar with James Maskell's work and group visits and doing some similar things with their team and coaches um, and some of these practices, but we really have to get to the, and, and I think the other challenging thing is we can go to like the umph extreme of um, having these concierge practices that are, functioning but with a lot of health coaches and like the patient is having to go through the health coach for everything which they're great but like when the patient actually needs to see the doctor there's so many like levels that they have to go up to like to 
to get their question answered that we're like moving so far away from individualized care. And even in those settings too, I've seen some some things happen. And so it's challenge. It's a challenge to provide like high quality individualized care to these really sick people um, and also not feel the burden of that and like, you know, be stressed out as providers too. But I might have got off the off what you were trying to, okay. <laughs> to get me to talk about. But um, but yeah, I think, you know, all of those those issues are, you know, a piece of the puzzle that we have to address with these patients. And it's not just, OK, your blood sugars are this. You need to eat like less carbs. It's what does your gut health look like? What does your um, you know, how are you eating? Are you sitting and chewing and like taking deep breaths or are you running around shoving food in your mouth as you're driving your kids around, um, which I'm guilty of? Um, but like, you know, looking at their environment, um, their story, you know, what history they have, it's all it's all so important. Definitely. And I'm glad you touched on all that, Dr. Hartzler, because of the primary care model and even the specialty model, as you said, there's not enough time if we're, if we're using insurance. And that's just one piece um, also. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, it's modern day living. And that was one of my questions. And you kind of yes. weaved it in already. But the why, you know, it might not just be the diet and misinformation, but the stress mm -hmm. driving up cortisol and driving up blood sugar yes. and causing blood sugar yes. dysregulation and all of these things yeah. mixed in. Um, especially when we mm -hmm. have like this culture where people are afraid of carbs, so then it is restrictive. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think there's mm -hmm. so many things we can touch on there. It, it's really exhausting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Patient, yeah. And, and we provider. know like, exactly. Yeah. I was talking to one of my patients on Tuesday and she's like, how do you know all this? Like she sits like, you know, in awe of like, and like very like sort of overwhelmed at the same time because we're like spitting all this stuff out um about their microbiome and all these things but um but yeah the microbiome is is such an integral portion of this and stress impacts our microbiome it also um microbiome is affected by our nutrition um whether we're eating high carb things versus you know good prebiotic fibers we also are impacted by our water supply and whether there's chlorine in that it's you know there's also impacts from um antibiotic use or history of antibiotic use and so there's so many different insults to it that then it gets out of whack and then we also get less diversity which less diversity means normally less um good bacterial byproducts so we have those short chain fatty acids which are like the postbiotics is by common you know, buzzword this year um but those postbiotics the one of the most important ones is butyrate and so that's supposed to keep our cells um healthy but also plays a role in the metabolic process so butyrate actually um the short chain fatty acids actually can help stimulate things like GLP-1 which is the hormone that tells your body to make insulin tells your brain you're full it's the hormone that you know our big drugs that um, are out on the market for weight loss and diabetes right now are actually mimicking because the hormone has such an important um role and so all of that really starts in our microbiome. Um, and so if we think about people, when we see them, that are, they're starting to progress towards diabetes at age, you know, 45. I mean, we went, there's a lot of stuff that has happened to their gut and a lot of things, um, you know, in the last, their whole lifetime, you know, that have to be considered. Um, and we're starting to see like probiotic strains come out with data about lowering blood sugar or improving the butyrate levels. Um, so that's just like one piece of it, but we've also got to think about, you know, their mitochondrial function, like I mentioned before. So we need, not only do we need iron, but we also need CoQ10. And so a lot of our cholesterol lowering drugs are called statins. Those can actually deplete CoQ10. And so, um, most of the data shows that we should have at least hundred milligrams of CoQ10 if the patient is taking a statin and we're not here to discuss if that's the right thing to do or not. Um, necessarily regarding the statin use, but most of the studies for statins are actually in like a, prevent, a secondary prevention population. So patients have already had some type of event and um, we're preventing the second event. Um, there's less less um, data showing, you know, the benefit from just the person that is doesn't have any like other risk factors, but has high cholesterol. Um, so that's something to discuss with provider, your provider too. like, you know, what are, you know, what is the number needed to treat for patients with um, this just more at risk versus the person that's had it before. But if you do decide that a statin is um, something that's important for you to take um, based on your health history, definitely making sure we have a, a solid amount of CoQ10 on board is important. 
And I really think there's something to that mechanism of the depletion of CoQ10 with statins to why we see patients on statins actually have increased risk of diabetes and increasing blood sugars um, related to the mitochondrial dysfunction. I think there's also some gut things going on there as well um, that are in the statin literature. But um, so anyways, but that is a piece. And then um, intestinal permeability is also a piece. So when we get the intestinal permeability, we also um, get these Gra- oftentimes gram negative bacteria that have what's called lipopolysaccharide um, that basically damages the gut lining um, and then stimulates this like immunological response that can ultimately result in chronic inflammation and damage to the pancreas. And so um, some of our patients when they're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes actually already have like less than 50% of their beta cell function by the time we hit that, you know, diabetes A1C you know, diagnosis at 6.5% or if they're looking at blood sugar over 126 in the morning. Um, a lot of times, like the pre-diabetes phase is really when all of this stuff is happening. And so that's why um, our team, and I didn't really mention what we do now, because I, I do still practice in that ambulatory care setting, but I also over the years have seen pharmacists um, that really want to get involved in this space. And I started a website called functionalmedicinece.com where we educate pharmacists on functional medicine and do um, continued education conferences uh, a couple times a year. We do a couple virtual and then we also have an in-person one in September every year. And um, as I started teaching more pharmacists about this, because I would apply to speak at various conferences and they would say no one was interested in this or you know not approve the talk. And I was like, yes, they are. They're asking Absolutely. me all the time about this. So, yeah, so that's why we started our own website, because I was like, well, I don't need the, you know, big organization up here, like, to give me permission to teach. So, so anyway, so we started that. But then as I started to teach pharmacists, I realized how, um, how many pharmacists wanted to do this because they're also frustrated with their careers at this point, um, especially those that are working for chain pharmacies. Um, there's just a lot being asked of them and with limited resources and staffing and a huge, huge, high stress population. Um, but those, but so that we started to work as a team with those pharmacists. And so we have now have a team of over 40 pharmacists that are across the country um, doing virtual consults with patients, supporting different offices in different places, um, and even supporting some companies that are doing um, some employer health things. So we've got lots of different ways people can plug us in. But um, one of the programs that we're coming out with now is called the Thrive Program, like I mentioned. But our passion is really to support people in that prevention um, standpoint. Not that we can't help you once you have diabetes. There's a lot of stuff we can do. But the most impact that we're going to make is when you need to, whether it's you need to start losing weight and, you know, a lot of obesity and uh, overweight is related to a lot of this gut microbiome stuff and nutrient depletions and stress and all the conversations we've been having. Um, so we want to help people here so that we don't get to this other side where they actually have the diabetes. And even in the pre-diabetes population, we know that there's, you know, some small studies that show zinc actually improves your insulin resistance. And if you have low zinc levels to start with, um, and we know, you know, based on COVID that we found out a lot of people are zinc deficient <laughs> in our in our country. And so there is a connection between zinc and insulin production. It's used in insulin production, but it also is used in the Krebs cycle and all of those processes um, that produce energy in the mitochondria. And um, even some of these studies showed they actually measured CRP in the groups um, that had prediabetes, so that inflammatory marker. And the zinc actually um, reduced inflammation as well. And so um, when we replaced that, so thinking about that population of people like that is probably, you know, microbiome disrupted, um, maybe poor diversity in the microbiome, having trouble losing weight. Um, and not that the microbiome is the only factor there. There are certainly genetic components and other things that, you know, are reasons, you know, pieces of the puzzle per se. Um, but if we think about the nutrient depletions and all of, you know, the energies piece, the mitochondrial function in the person's body, there's a lot we can do at this point to help you know, ward off, um, even hormone balance um, type things um, can be really important at that stage and stress reduction. So, um, yeah, so that's really our passion and why we, you know, came up with that program. And so we're enrolling right now for for that. And maybe by the time the listeners um, will be enrolling for January, probably by the time this is listened to. But 
Um, we really want to help people, you know, get to the point of thriving and not feel like this is just, oh, it's ine- inevitable that I'm going to have type 2 diabetes. And there's some things we can't control. We can't control the toxins in the environment that also probably contribute to insulin resistance in various ways. Oh, but the things that we can control, we're, you know, going to encourage people to, you know, change and, you know, make an impact in their life. Sure. And I want to know, Dr. Dr. Hartzler, um, what form of zinc? Do you remember in the study or what form of zinc do you like to use? And you're you know, I think salt. Yeah, zinc sulfate was used in one of the studies. I'd have to go back and look at the other one to see if it was if they actually said or if they just said the elemental amount of zinc. Um, but I can send you the references for yeah, sure. Maybe we can put that in the show notes. Um, actually, yeah, in the show notes. Yeah, um, but yeah, so yeah, it was like twenty to twenty five milligrams was the amount that they um, actually normally studied. I have some notes up here. Um, and I'm always interested yeah, so I'll in have to send this because over. zinc carnosine, I think, is what most of our listeners are familiar with if they're working on gut health, yeah. which so many of us are. Um, but then yeah. there's picolinate, which is um, yes. supposedly better absorbed. So I think, yeah, it, just really interesting. Yeah. Um, but yes, we I think we generally all need a bit more zinc <laughs> for so many yes, different reasons. Yes. And I think it might not even matter as much about like what form it is as much as how much is getting absorbed. Mm-hmm. So as long as we're getting, you know, the elemental zinc absorbed, I think, but depending on what form it is might tell us how much we need to take of a certain type. But yeah, the the studies that that I'm most familiar with use zinc sulfate, either 20 or 30 milligrams. Okay. Um, and one of them was over six months um, and one of them was 12 months studies. So very cool. They also yeah, improved insulin resistance markers, um, which is like HOMO IR, which is like a sort of fancy formula that they use the insulin level and the blood glucose levels and things. So it's pretty cool. Um, but that's just like one nutrient, right? So there's, you know, magnesium, like I said, there's CoQ10, there's omegas, like all of these things are in- involved in so many different processes in our body. And so if someone is significantly depleted in nutrients, like they're not going to be able to have optimal physiology, which includes, you know, regulating those blood sugars. And it's really foundational stuff that I think we're always getting back to on this show because we can talk about all day the the confusion that goes on in diet culture and the stress and the toxins. But mm-hmm. are we getting the nutrients in in the first place to contend with these insults, you know, that we have less control right. over, as you mentioned? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So and I. I don't have this in my outline. I'm going off script here, but I'd love to know what do you think about <laughs> um, organ supplements or just incorporating organ meats into the diet to get those nutrients yeah. that we oftentimes miss? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, certainly I'm not a dietitian, so that I, but I think like based on what I've read and like, there's a lot of iron certainly and some of those organ meats. There's also a lot of like healthy fats and also a lot of fat soluble vitamins. So like you know, especially our vitamin A. And um, so I think that definitely if people, I mean, eating them is challenging for a lot of Americans. Buy them. Um, I used, yes, yes. yes. I used to buy yeah. like, yeah, like a whole cow and then like take the liver and mix it with the ground beef. I mean, this was like early stage, only had one kid, <laughs> you know, and I would make her like these meatballs and she would eat them surprisingly, which I think beef liver smells terrible, but <laughs> She would eat them. You're like, okay. Um, nowadays, if I gave her this, ch- if I gave her that, she would probably like run away. But um, <laughs> my son would have never, never eaten it probably. Well, he might have at the beginning, but as they age, they start, you know, and then more sugar stuff creeps in from birthday parties yeah, and all these friends, things. All of a sudden yeah. their like taste buds are, are, and you know, I, we don't always not have sugar <laughs> things here either, but you know, life. Um, but I think, yeah, I think if we can incorporate, um, those types of foods into our diet or if they're supplements. I mean, there are several supplement companies that will use like whole glands um, and those, you know, a lot of um, chiropractors use like standard process that has a lot of those type glands. And so I think if if you're working with, I wouldn't say people should just go out and like buy like, you know, like organ type supplements without really knowing what they need. But there are some like just general beef, like the beef liver supplements that they want to get iron from a more natural source um, that would probably be good in terms of standard yeah. and lack of fda oversight mm-hmm. you know is there contamination? yeah yeah I, mean, I get freaked out about yeah prions. i mean like how careful are yeah they? Like, it's just really it's so yes. appealing in terms yes. of the benefit but if it's, we're not yes. doing it right well, i even think about that in like buying like when we were buying like a whole cow or a quarter of cow i was like well if it's coming from this one farm like, do they test their water? What is their, like, 
contamination look like on the farm, yeah. whether it's like the grass or the soil or all of those kinds of things. And I'm buying this like one place. So is it better to buy like, you know, different types from different places mm-hmm. so that if there's is a contamination, oh, like it's not all, it's you know, all of your things are in one bucket. I know. Right. But like your brain, Oof. your brain goes there sometimes. But yeah. But definitely from the supplement, you definitely want to make sure that you're getting a really good um, source product. Yeah. I mean, and do you have any, I mean, I know it's a specific topic, but just glandulars in general, because a lot of it's over the counter. So any tips or yeah. red flags for listeners? Um, I mean, I would just not buy supplements off of Amazon yeah, if I, I were listening, um, which yeah. like I hate that. Patients will like automatically go there. They'll be sitting in our office and like looking it up to see how much it costs on Amazon. But yes, um, but the problem with that is that there's so many false products. Like some of the companies I've worked with have actually purchased their products that are being sold on Amazon, tested them, and they're nothing is the same in the bottle as what it's labeled as, even though it has their bottle um, and their, you know, label and everything. So you just have to be really careful. Um, And I think like working with providers and like, companies that just work through providers to recommend Medicaid or recommend supplements is probably the best place to go. Um, a lot of those companies will provide their testing to show you exactly what's in the capsule is in the capsule. And they'll also um, show you like any data on like excipient type added things to they'll test for heavy metals and things like that. Um, so if the company that you're buying from can't provide that, then I would say that you would want to use that supplement. Yeah, great tip. And there are online dispensaries like Well of Eight and Whole Script mm-hmm. and Full Script where yeah. they have quality control yes. programs and yes. it might be only yes. available through your provider, but right. it's I think it's worth yes. the investment there yes. and the time and energy. Yeah, it's interesting. Some of those platforms are starting to pull in more consumer-based brands too to it. So mm-hmm. um and actually, it'd be interesting to talk to them about, like, are you, like, actually testing these products that are, you know, also available to people other I places? Wonder about that. But yeah, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I would say, you know, it's having those conversations with your provider that's recommending them. Um, and if cost is a concern, like tell your provider that, because I realize, like if I'm recommending these gut regimens for people, it is expensive at the beginning. I mean, yes, most of the time, some of that's only for three months, um, you know, maybe, maybe a little longer, um, but some of it might stay on, you know, for six months or more. So making sure you, you know, have a conversation about what your budget is so that they can try to find products that maybe have um, multiple ingredients in them versus single products um, or sort of deciding what your priorities are. You know, is it, you know, you need to focus on this and this first and then move on to this um, with what your budget allows. But we realize that people don't have endless amounts of money often to spend on whether that's testing or, you know, their supplement regimen. Hmm. All good points. And I know it's such an overwhelming (laughs) topic for a lot of people. So appreciate you sharing that. Um, I do. I can't believe we're almost at time. My gosh, we've already covered so much, but I would be remiss if we didn't talk about your company. So I want to talk about Farm to Table. Definitely sounds like a game changer. I love the idea of educating pharmacists in the functional medicine space because it seems very promising, obviously, for for patient care and getting more of that holistic perspective. What impact do you envision this education having on the healthcare landscape? And can you tell us briefly about your goals or initiatives? Um, yeah. What you're doing? Yes. So one side of the business, like I mentioned, is on that functional medicine CE website. And our goal there is really to provide accessible, like affordable education in functional medicine. Um, and, you know, pharmacists have to get continuing education uh, credits anyways. Um, throughout the year. And so why not do it in something they actually want to learn, um, especially if they're trying to like turn their careers into um, helping people with these things. But I think about like all the pharmacists across the country that are being asked every day um, in the OTC aisle, what should I take for my constipation or what should I take for my heartburn? Um, And certainly we're taught in school to hand them the 14 day supply of the, you know, the PPI medication or we're, you know, taught to give them DocuSate and Senna and Miralax and all of these things. Um, But like, if we can just like shift that mindset of like, okay, well, let's maybe ask a few questions about what you're eating, how much water you're drinking, like as a first step. Um, And then as a second step, like maybe we can offer some strategies that'll help actually improve their microbiome, whether that's like a fiber supplement that actually has prebiotic fibers or maybe 
it's, you know, a probiotic that has data um, for patients who have constipation. So um, the pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare professional. I think I was mentioning before, like sometimes there's layers of people you have to get through in like a phone chain to really actually talk to the provider. But you can just pick up the phone and talk to a pharmacist or you can pick up, you know, you can go and walk in and the healthcare provider is right there without an appointment. That's been a challenging part of our profession, but it also, um, from the patient care standpoint, like they have the ability to make a huge impact um, because they are so accessible. So, um, so really, that's what you know that side of the business is about is like arming people with tools. They might not be doing full out consults um, in their day to day work. Some of them do have like little offices to the side of the pharmacy where they envision sitting down with people that schedule appointments and having these conversations, but. Even if they're not, um, being able to think about the nutrient depletions, maybe, you know, educating people that are getting statins at the pharmacy, like that you need the CoQ10 or educating people on birth control that they should probably have some additional B vitamins on board. Uh, Whatever that looks like from a nutrient depletion standpoint and the drugs, um, I think that, I mean, that can be a huge game changer, PPIs and iron, like having conversations with patients so that we can prevent those, um, you know, outcomes from happening. And then um, also, you know, the pa- you know the patient being able to to utilize that information and you know share with their community and it, or there's like more impacts beyond even just those people that are joining on our CEs. So, um, so I that's that side of it. But then the other side of it, where we actually have a team of pharmacists is working together. As we started to learn more about what pharmacists needed in this space, we realized not all of them wanted to be entrepreneurs. So um, there wasn't like a indie job for like pharmacists, functional pharmacists or any kind of like health system, you know, hiring a functional pharmacist. Although there have started to be some wellness programs where pharmacists are, you know, being asked to be per- participants of. But um, because of that, people either had to decide, OK, I can implement this in my current practice if they can, um, or I can start my own business and try to do this on the side or, you know, figure out a way to do it. So a lot of people um, appreciated the idea of coming together as a community instead of all of us, you know, running our own separate things and trying to get our own, you know, um, businesses going and managing the day to day of that. um, Doing it together has a lot of benefits because when one person creates a handout, everybody can access that handout or one person creates a flyer or creates a class. Like we all have the ability to to utilize those things. Um, And then also, you know, as a group, like we're marketing, you know, together, but we also practice within our own state licenses. So if I get, you know, people reaching out to our main website that are from other states, then I can say, okay, here's my pharmacist license in in those states. And um, because I, you know, I knew I didn't want one, I don't think like a lot of functional medicine providers, because a lot of the work that we do is really heavy. 40 hours plus a week of doing it is not like sustainable on anyone's mental health. Mm-hmm. And so if I can train other people to serve, you know, across the country, I'm going to impact way more, way more patients than just um, me trying to do it just just here. Um so we have that. And then we also, like I said, have employer health programs. So employers can say, yes, we want maybe, you know, with certain plans, we might look at their data and say, okay, you are spending a lot of money on these GI drugs, or you're spending a lot of money over here. How can we um, take that patient population and help them to actually get well through this process and um, look at the cost savings um, to that as well? So we have the prediabetes obesity program, um, but we can also, you know, do more of a general um, functional medicine approach with any real conditions. Um, out there. So that's sort of another focus that we're, you know, working towards, um, you know, to help employers reduce costs um, in their health, but also help their employers have their employees have more vitality and actually, you know, less sick days and all of those kinds of things um, by getting by getting well. So so that's one of the things um, there's a lot of people doing similar work in that space. So it it is it's definitely a challenge to navigate like what employers are looking for. And um, but I think it's and it's something that we are working with a couple companies to support their employer health programs. One is an autoimmune company. So they um, help employers save costs on expensive autoimmune drugs. But then they recognize that part of the autoimmune process is to help them get off that is, it doesn't always mean they're going to get off the medication, but maybe it means we won't have to escalate the dose, or maybe it means we need less of the medication, um, or potentially someone might be, have the ability to get off if they, you know, make these drastic sort of lifestyle changes and, um, 
and go through that functional medicine process. But working and there's lots of cool things happening in this space out there because we know the cost of healthcare has just gone through the roof. And and so, yeah, so we really are passionate about that and trying to we're still we take patients on our website. People can sign up and pay for our services. But that's also an element of what we're trying to do is, is work on that end as well. And then, like I mentioned before, we also can support practices. So we have, you know, we can contract with pharmacies that want to expand their functional medicine service. We can contract with um, with uh, physicians offices that want to expand it, um, whether that's even in person or just virtual. Um, so if they're, ha- you know, need additional providers, um, we can, you know, support in that way. Or even just one of our pharmacists meets with a a PA practice um, that's two PAs. I mean, they have a medical director, but they don't, they both, um, their background was ER before they came into the functional medicine space. And so, like I mentioned before, they don't have a lot of chronic disease drug therapy management because they went right. from ER acute care to to functional medicine. Um, so she does like a, a sort of like a grand round slash like call, a huddle call with them um, once a month or once every other couple of weeks and like goes through some of their difficult cases and makes her recommendation. So trying to bring that like collaborative team care that we see so often in hospitals or even in clinics to like this virtual space of these functional medicine providers and, and, you know, helping to sort of, you know, round it out so that uh, patients don't feel like they're, you know, being thrown from one place to another. Mm. So much yeah. good work. That's so yeah. timely and so needed. And especially when people are trying to navigate, practitioners and patients, again, trying to navigate this yes. wellness yes. space that is yes. so overwhelming. Yes. So, yes, it's amazing. so overwhelming. I mean, there's so many people trying to do different things in the wellness space. So I think that like that is, gets like, there's a lot of noise, I guess I like to say. Like, so trying to like help people actually, you know, get down to the evidence and and where we use something, where we don't. And yeah. yeah, it's it's a challenge. It's a it's fun challenge, but sometimes <laughs> some days not so fun. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful you're doing the work you're doing, and yeah, thank that you. Time flew by. We packed in so much wonderful information in. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Hartzler. We're gonna wrap it up. Um, and we just to sum it up for our listeners, we touched on the connection between diabetes and gut health and practical tips for practices and how to really incorporate um, functional medicine and being mindful that it really a starting place with your training programs, I think is really a big take home message for maybe mm-hmm. people who are listening, who feel like their heads are spinning and maybe they're new to functional medicine. Yeah. Um, your training programs, I think that's a wonderful resource. So where can folks find you? Yeah. Well, we have the Pharma's Table website is P-H-A-R-M-T-O-T-A-B-L-E dot life. And then we also have the Functional Medicine CE, which either is fxmedce.com or functionalmedicinece.com spelled out. Um, we are also, I guess I should mention, um, through the functionalmedicinece.com, we will have more information about this up by the time this um, publishes, but we are going to be taking an Alaskan cruise and doing a lifestyle medicine CE next right. summer. Oh. Um, so that will be open exactly. for CME credit and CPE credit. So pharmacists, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs. We're also going to have a track for more of the consumer um, HR um, sort of like lay, not want to say lay person, but someone that's non-healthcare provider track as well. Um, so we're excited, really excited about that. Um, so definitely if you want to cruise to Alaska with us, um, connect with us there or on Instagram. We're at FXMedCE on Instagram and then also um, at Farm to Table Team. And then mine is at Farm to Table dot Life. So, so lots of places, but you can start by coming to our website. Um, if you're interested in the Thrive program, it's it's on the website or you can do backslash Thrive Farm to Table dot Life backslash Thrive. So Lots of different ways to stay connected. We're also on LinkedIn for those providers um, that are listening. Um, definitely follow us on LinkedIn too. All right. And if you're listening, don't worry. We'll have all of these links in the show notes. So <laughs> the show notes you don't need yes. to, to scramble. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hartzler, for yeah, being thank here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. And until next time, everyone, stay by. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so we can continue to pay it forward together. And remember, the key to longevity is knowledge. Keep learning, growing, and tuning in to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast to discover the latest insights and strategies for optimal health. Join us again next week.
Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational and informational purposes and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The views expressed by guests and hosts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of Vibrant Wellness. As always, consult your healthcare provider before applying any recommendations that you heard here today.